Hello, and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Jatin Solanke from DQ. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we're taught, joined by Jatin Solanke, the founder of DQ. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest. But in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Jatin, hello and welcome. Hey, Shannon. I'm super excited. Uh, thank you for having me here and excited to share my journey and how I reached to this uh, position. I'm so excited to connect with you. Uh, and so, Tell me, you're the founder of DQ. So tell me, what type of business is this? What what have you started here? Well, DQ is a unified platform which uh, manages data observability, data catalog, and governance. And the reason why we have a unified platform because we don't want people to juggle between multiple applications. And, and also the biggest struggle of a data leaders or data managers is the single source of truth. And that's exactly what we're trying to solve with our uni- unified platform. And that's what Dcube does at a very, very high level. Oh, I love that a lot. Uh, it's definitely a need out there for sure. We hear that from our community all the time. So you're in a sweet spot there for sure. So, so, um, so what do you do then? What does your typical work week look like as a founder? I'm sure you work with lots of data yourself. Yeah, as a founder of DQ, uh, my job is to bring the data domain expertise within the team itself. Our team comprises of software engineers, data engineers, and even machine learning experts. My job is to ensure that everything is tied and we are focused on one vision itself. How does a typical week look like? Though I'm a founder, but we need to sell what we build. So I spend a lot of time on the on the discovery call, talking to data leaders of what kind of challenges they are facing, especially around data observability. And, and we try to see whether Dcube can fit into that environment. And if it doesn't, I also take the feedback from them. And also that will help me to sharpen the product for the future roadmap. So that's precisely how how a week looked like for me. And 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 I love doing that every minute, every day, every week. Yeah, you you, you have to be passionate about something to to found a start a company, right? Absolutely. I mean, you you have to be passionate, you have to love what you do. Uh otherwise uh, you don't have the fire within you. If and if you are not motivated enough. Uh, it's quite a challenge for you to bring that same motivation within your employees uh, and get the similar kind of output. So tell me, was this the dream when you say you were six years old? <laughs> Did you say, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to uh, found a company to to solve data governance problems? Uh, honestly, no. Uh, okay. But what I was do, the dream? I do. <laughs> my my dream was, you know, my, I was very very fascinated with, uh, you know, the 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 uh, commercial pilots, right? Mm. So I I always I always dreamt like, you know, can I how can I be the commercial pilot? And and today also, uh, I I do have a flight simulator at home, and which is like a a, a proper flight simulator. Uh, I, I do enjoy that. It's it's also one of the areas which I love, uh, you know, flying aircrafts and all. But of course, I didn't. I didn't sort of you know. Uh, didn't sort of focus on that. I want to be a, a founder of a startup and all. Uh, but but the way it actually the journey is is more from an inception point of view, where 
uh, my my father was an entrepreneur, so he had a large business. I, I lost him, you know, quite early in twenty o three. Uh, but there are a couple of learnings I got from him, especially, you know, that when you want to do, especially on the business. So I was always like also loving what the business is and how what it takes. Right. And, and of course, if you're being a founder or if you are a businessman, uh, you definitely earn a lot of wealth. Right. Uh, but that's not like something which is guaranteed. You need to work towards it. Uh I definitely wanted to be like a commercial pilot, but I didn't know like, and I will end up into a businessman. Uh, but again, here, uh, one of the things which I learned from my father was don't jump the ship. First, learn about it. First, spend the time, build the domain expertise, uh, see where you want to head to. And that's precisely what I did. I spent a lot of time in the data space, data domain. And, and then I decided that this is a problem I need to solve. And that's how I ended up as a founder. Oh, very nice. And, and first, you know, I want to say I'm sorry for your for your loss uh, and how nice that you're you're building his memory into your business. Um, so. Uh, so tell me, though, so as you started growing up, then how did you start change the passion and from like, I want to be a pilot to uh, what did you start studying and where did you start uh how did you start moving your career forward before uh, getting into data? Yeah, so one was the fantasy world, you know, that the commercial pilot you want to be. The other is when I was graduating in my academics, um, I I found out, and even even you know, along with my my brother, my with my father, if I found out that I'm pretty good in mathematics, right? And and gradually, you know, the passion towards numbers uh, sort of grew within me. Um, so I did spend, you know, from an academic perspective, I did my bachelor's in business. Uh, but again, I, I did my master's in finance with minors in statistics from one of the top uh, B schools in India. And and after that, also, I did postgraduate diploma in, in a data science and AI. So sort of, you know, the academics, which is more like a foundation for you, I've spent a lot of time there, and and as I as I was as I was just mentioning, as I was graduating towards my academic career, uh, that's where the, the passion towards number grew, and and it was like when I when I got a first campus offer, it was in in the data field itself, and which is why I decided that hey, this is something which I really love, you know, spending my time understanding data, uh, crunching numbers at that time, and and which is why I continue in that field. Um, the, the, again, the passion, uh, you know, grew as a sort of, you know, sort of progress in my career. And and I, this is one of the fields which I, I don't regret, you know, sort of, you know, starting my career with, and I love doing it. It's amazing. So you just really got into data just right away. Uh, yeah, I love that a lot. So, you know, so what's been the biggest lesson so far in your in your career? Uh, yeah, so a couple of lessons out there. Uh, I guess, you know, the biggest lesson uh, is the foundational layer, right? So I'm talking into uh, sort of, you know, folds here. So one is one is at the team side. Uh, no matter, you know, when you are heading a department, or you're a manager, or you are in a very early stage of your career, I guess, you know, you need to spend a lot of time, you know, building that foundational layer. Uh, because if you are if you are a head of department, and if the bottom layer uh, of your team is not performing well, it's going to impact your metrics, your performance. Uh, so ensure that, you know, the bottom layer is always happy. If they are happy, the middle layer will be happy. And if they are happy, you are happy, right? So to spend more time with them, uh, understand what more what is what is you know, what's their motivation. Uh, mm-hmm. some, and most of the times I also learn money is not the motivation, the, not the driver every time. Um, and I always have uh, I always have a tendency to spend uh, you know a little bit of time on understanding their personal kind of goals too, right? You know, understanding about their family because that impacts the performance. If a, if a one person has a fight with his fa- fight with his wife, that morning is not good for him. It's not productive. 
right so if you understand that uh, that sort of you know background of the person it really helps you to get the best out of the person itself uh, on the on the personal side uh, i i i think so you know the collaboration between other departments is super crucial and uh, when you are a data leader or even though for that matter data manager it's very very crucial for you to you know manage your stakeholders and and one of the lessons which i have learned uh, in past was so i was building a, a machine learn model and i was ready with the model but one of the biggest things which i didn't do properly was the stakeholder management especially from the product management side and so i was ready with the api and the product said hey you know it's two months away from now so so again you know boiling down is is the collaboration the stakeholder management is something super super crucial considering that the data department is also like one of the is is the center part of the business value chain you are supplying the data you are working with multiple stakeholders you need to ensure that you know you you spend tremendous amount of time there wow i i love those lessons um uh, and, you know, I love that the, you mentioned that the lessons come from, you know, a, a challenge and, 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 and a misstep, if so to speak, um, in order to learn it. And how, what a great message to like how important the people are, uh, no matter what you're doing. And you're talking about building, you know, AI and, uh, you know, it's not replacing your people, but, but the people are so important to uh, what it is you are building. That's really, really nice. Um, so, so tell me, you know, uh, having worked with data for so long now and, and, and it being your primary focus, um, what is your definition of data? Well, any, uh, even today we are talking on the podcast, there's a, <laughs> there's, there's a tons of amount of data out there, the way I speak, the way you speak. Uh, my my gesture, even the words which I emphasize on, uh, can define my personality. So, for me, the da data could be in any shape and form. Uh, mostly, I look at whether it's a structural data, whether it's unstructured data. So, even you take an image on your iPhone or or any phone for that matter, that's a data. Uh, even when you're talking to anyone on the phone, that's data. So data is like any form in a digital format, right? Or it isn't necessary to say digital, but it could be in a physical format too. Uh, but there's any exchange of information in in any language, either, either it's a binary language, either it's a, it's a vernacular language, it's English. That to me is a definition of data. Uh, and, and nowadays there are so many tools out there where you can collect whether your unstructured data that's your image, audio, and any other files. And, and the other thing is the structural data, what, what kind of interactions you do with the application. Uh, that, is, that is something more like structured data. But yeah, that that's to me is data. But uh, the next step towards the data is how do you translate that into a knowledge? Uh, and that is something which is very, very crucial, uh, you know, as, as a data leader, as a data manager, very true. Any best practices to translate that data and put it into context? Well, there are a lot of uh, libraries available where you can sort of translate that data into uh, into you know a, a certain form, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like just to give you an example, if there is a the image. Uh, you can definitely use libraries to convert that image into a binary language, right? Where you can, we can just convert like all the colors, like, you know, it, it's, you know, the colors have a range of zero to two, five, six. So you can define that, you can actually pixelate that into, into a matrix, into a numbers. The other form, which is the very, very, um, you know, simple is you dump it a lake. And nowadays, a lot of companies are uh, adopting that structure. Where you, you sort of ingest or sort of store everything in the likes of Amazon S3 or something like you know Google. Uh, so it's more like a bloop storage. That's what I'm predominantly going through. So that's that's the I would say one of the best practices out there. Very nice. 
So especially having worked with data for so long, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? Well, this is this is a tricky question. Uh, but at the same time, you know, at a very early stage, after discussing with a few of the data leaders out there uh, in the industry, the data management is definitely going to evolve as companies geared to invest in generative AI. And uh, I believe that having generative AI, the roles will redefine within data itself. We may have less amount of data analysts because the generative AI is able to crunch the numbers, is able to slice the numbers. Business will be able to directly interact with those models and understand the data pretty easier and faster. But at the same time, for your model to perform well, you need to feed the data in a in a you know accurate fashion, or you need to feed the reliable data. So that's where the 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 dependency on your data engineers, your data ops people becomes more critical. So I see the weightage changing. Right, you may end up having more data engineers, more data operation people. Because mm -hmm. as company invest in in the generative AI, uh, you need to have more pipelines, you know, more data going in, more unstructured data, you know, and you need to take out the the meaning out of the data. So again, there you will require some of the ML experts and AI engineers too to maintain that model and continuously monitor that model too. So I see that shift happening in, and definitely. Mm -hmm one of the reasons why we are focusing and every company needs to focus on the data reliability because that lays the foundation again for whether it's your AI model or whether it is your data products internally. If you have a right and reliable data, accurate information, you will get accurate output. Otherwise, it's a typical saying we have is garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so that's the paradigm shift which I'm uh, which, which are early signs are, are showing. Uh, but again, as the models evolve, as the as the generative AI evolves across in the coming few uh, years, I guess we we also geared uh, to sort of you know change that uh, within our data management uh, as a as a community. Uh, but uh, in a, again, just to answer that, you know, from an outcome perspective, I see there's definitely going to be an increase in in the in the data management people. Uh, within the organization itself. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. And, you know, I, so, and you mentioned, you know, the, the garbage in, garbage out and how important it is to have quality data going into your models, you know, so putting an emphasis and, and stress on then, you know, the importance of data governance in order to manage that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I guess, you know, the data governance, uh, as you, as you graduate into your journey of the data management, um, it, so sometimes I have seen that the data governance is not required on day one itself. Uh, but as you, as you, it is, I mean, based on my uh, best practices, I would include that into day one, but I'm just more talking towards the reality part of it, right? Because as the company is developing uh, the data practices internally, uh, they hit a wall where they need to bring in more control, right? They have understood uh, what it takes to drive the data internally for growth, uh, and which is where now they want to bring a control saying that we would require a module, a framework like data governance because we have so much data internally. We ex we have external data, IoT data. We have internal sensitive data. We have certain inter. We have like you know transactional customer data and so on and so forth, uh, which is where then access becomes like a challenge, like. How do you provide access to the people and how do you monitor those access? And that's one element. The other element is you have certain sensitive information. Some of the financial companies have credit information about you as a person. 
So you need to ensure that those are protected from even the internal employees. And, and that's where the requirement of data governance comes into picture. Uh, and, and which is why it's very, very crucial. Uh, at the same time, people need to realize the importance of it. Uh, it is a long-term game. It is not something like a magic wand. Uh, it is not like an AI model also where you deploy and you may see the results in a, in a month or so. It's also a cultural change. Right? It's the way you function, the way you define your processes internally. Uh, so that's where the data governance uh, comes into picture. Uh, again, I also emphasize the data governance is more like a framework which you need to bring across in the organization, the cultural changes. Then you should look at the tooling part. The, we solve the tooling problem, but if you in, deploy the tool now and there's still not a change in the culture or the, or the frame or the process itself, it's not going to reap any benefits for you. So that that's something is is very, very important for all the companies to to sort of emphasize on is the importance of the framework. You know, it's interesting. We still hear from a lot of people that they're struggling to get funding for or get uh, executives to buy off on uh, even starting a data governance initiative. You know, what would you say to those executives say, hey, you know, this is why it's not it's so many executives think that the you know data governance is a dirty word and and you know it's really just about adhering to you know uh, laws but it's so much more like you just said than that and it's so important to the management of the data within the company so so what would be your sales pitch to somebody who's who's not yet on board um, to understand the importance of why it could benefit the company yeah this is this is super important and and this is also very important question for a lot of data leaders out there, even for executives. Uh, the way I help the the data leaders because we work very closely with the data leaders to sort of champion internally, and and be sort of you know sponsor this particular data governance project where they can onboard us, right? So it's it's, it's actually for me it's a greed out there, but in reality. Uh, where even when I was a data leader and you know, when I wanted to pitch in the data governance framework, uh, the way I got the buy-in was you you don't need to talk the data, uh, the technical language in front of your executives. Uh, they really won't understand uh, what you are trying to define, what what is the kind of impact. Uh, so what I did was I simplified things for them right? because we as uh, as as maybe exact or even like a human, we are more reactive than preventive, right? And and data governance is, is also part of preventive kind of you know, frameworks. So we always have to showcase that, what is the impact if your data gets leaked out? So if you sort of, you know, this is just one example. If you tell your executives that, hey, if your data get leaks out, uh, first of all, you get a loss of millions of dollars. The other thing is the reputation of the company. and. And you know, we all know the negative news spread across like like you know, bush in the fire. And but at the same time, uh, if it is like so if the reputation gets impacted, it also impacts your your customer sentiments. They they might not do business with you. Uh, and even if it is a B2B companies, the businesses might not want to engage with you because you're not uh, safeguarding your data in a in a right fashion. So this is just one of the replications you will see and if the, your data gets leaked out, right? So if you are able to explain that, and I'm sure executives will give you a buy for that. At the same time, you also need to tell them like what it takes to bring that uh, project in. What is, the, what is the absolute dollar value? And what's the absolute dollar value in terms of returns you will be getting uh, you know, in, in the next three or four years? Uh, what's the kind of savings you have? So it's more like a total cost of ownership kind of model but again, you also need to understand what's the value you're driving internally. That is something which is very crucial. And the value sometimes is not always about absolute dollar because subjects like data governance and even for that matter, data observability, uh, these are subjective. Right? These are like productive, uh, these are productive tools. Right? It helps you to improve productivity internally. Uh, so you will see the gradual change in the, in the coming months slash years which is why you will always see this data governance is not like a, 
a SaaS tool which you can install it today and uninstall it tomorrow. So that's something which doesn't happen that way. So if you if you sort of focus on all these elements and put a very simplified version to your executives, uh, you will get a high. It's a high probability for you to get uh, the approvals slash you know the 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 kind of stamp on your on your project saying that please go ahead uh, and do the procurement. Very nice. So then tell me, what would advice would you give to people who are looking to get into a career in data management, especially with the shift, as you mentioned, happening? Uh, so what do you think people should focus on and what should they, they how should, how do they get into this, these, a data engineering role for say, per se? Yeah. So again, as I just uh, personally speaking, uh, we have to emphasize more on the foundational layer of, of what it takes. Uh, to be a data engineer, to be a, a ML experts or AI experts out there, uh, but if you if you notice, there are a couple of things which are pretty common. Uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's writing codes on Python, maybe it's it's writing codes on some other language for that matter. So having I would say basic skills about you know the, the coding skills about Python or some other common languages would be really really important. Uh, but at the same time, the reason why the foundational knowledge helps you is tomorrow, if there's a new language which comes in and it sort of overpowers Python, you need to have you need to have the skills to immediately shift into those new languages itself, which is why if you have the right foundation, like maybe of some of the basics of computer science, uh, doesn't matter. You don't have to do a degree in computer science, but maybe just understanding some of the modules out there, which there are a lot of websites available today where people can learn that. Uh, the other thing is, is is about spending about time of how data, what is the data framework? What are the types of data you have? Uh, what is What it takes to write a SQL query? Uh, so there are this basic functional uh, knowledge which is already available. Uh, I'm more inclined to uh, towards the data engineering part where you need to have a basic of, you know, how does an SQL, uh, how do you write an SQL script? Uh, you know, some of the basic Python scripts but also some of the technologies nowadays has become quite common, right? How do you, how do you, how, what is uh, Kafka? What is the event streaming? Because as, as companies are investing in the data management, people want real time and, and there are solutions out there which does this real time streaming. So it's better to have a knowledge of it, maybe not the deployment knowledge or more, not the sort of an advanced knowledge, but when you're preparing yourself for an interview or even that you want to graduate into this particular role, build that, have that particular layer itself defined for you, invest there. Uh, I would say if uh, I would not jump into getting into interview rounds, but I would jump into, so I would actually spend more time in sort of preparing myself, upskilling myself, take a pause there, and then sort of go in the interview and start sort of you know discussing about the roles. Oh, well, Jitain, well, thank you so much. I mean, that's really uh, very helpful and really uh, great advice. So, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask, you know, if somebody want to learn more about DeCube and how it can help their business, how would they find you? Well, uh, they can just uh, type in the word DeCube in Google, and I'm sure we will, we will be the first link uh, appearing there. Alternatively, you can also search on, uh, just type in dcube.io and you will be on our website. Uh, it's a very, I try to again, simplify things for, for all the data people out there. Uh, what we do, how, and, and how we sort of, you know, interact with your data uh, structure, infrastructure. Uh, so yeah, that's, you will find more information. Alternatively, you can also find me on LinkedIn uh, and and I love to talk with data uh, people, uh, and and you know happy to spend some time in even simplifying what exactly the framework of data observability, governance, even data catalog for that matter. Oh, very nice. Well, thank you so much, and we'll get those links uh, posted on the podcast page for everybody so they can click on those and and chat with you. Thank you. That would be fantastic. That would be easy browse for everyone. <laughs> Indeed. Well, today it's been such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you so much once again for having me. And, and I'm, I'm excited to see 
uh, you know, the published version of it. Uh, once again, thank you so much. Uh, you guys have a fantastic day and a week ahead uh, and look forward for the, uh, I, I've already subscribed to your talks. I love hearing more from you guys. Uh, and thanks for again, uh, helping the other data people uh, to sort of learn from, from data leaders out there in the market. And this is, this kind of learning is definitely required. Uh, and you are also building a community out there, which I'm, I'm super excited for. Oh, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And and uh, I look forward to uh, the community learning more about your product. It, it just, again, it's a nice sweet spot that you've got going on there. So, uh, and to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date on the latest in podcasts and the latest in data management education, you may go to datariversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe.